So the story today is from this book. How many, have any of you guys read this book before? You might have spotted it at the ABC. You've broken a stick before. Okay, very good. I'm glad you have that in common with it. This, the book is called Broken Stick, and it is a collection of true stories that happened to some missionaries who are way out in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific, many thousands of miles from here where they never see snow, they never hear snow plows going past outside of the building. But this missionary and his wife, they were both missionaries, Norman and uh, Ruby Ferris, they were called by God to go to these missionaries where people had never heard about God before. And not only had they never heard about God, they had heard a lot about Satan. These islands practice devil worship. And sometimes when we think about the words devil worship, we think, oh yeah, it just means you make an idol and you kind of, you know, you, you talk to the idol, you sacrifice the idol, and nothing ever happens. But no, this was real devil worship. Like, there were actually devils helping them out on the island. On this island that Norman and Ruby Ferris wanted to help out, the island of Bolana, the people on that island worshipped the devil and they apparently had such a good connection with, with Satan that they could get special powers. They could actually float. People who had come to visit the island had spotted them floating short distances in the air, levitating. I don't know about you, but I can't do it no matter how much I try. If I jump into the air, my feet come back down to the ground. But with the help of Satan, they could actually do things like that. And people were very scared to go to the island of Balana because the island of Balana had just these fierce warriors on it that would come to meet anybody who showed up on the beach. Explorers and people who had come sailing by in their ships and stopped in the island of Balana to explore it had spread tales of being met by horrible things, by all of a sudden these groups of three or four hundred warriors painted up with long spears, Spears that were five meters long, and if you want to know what five meters is, a meter is about this distance, like that, okay? So if we do five meters, let's measure it with a pew here. One, two, three, four, five. So just a little bit longer than this. Now imagine a spear that long, and imagine 300 people each carrying one of those, and they're really good at throwing them. Do you think those would be pleasant ex encounters to have? No, they could launch those spears hundreds of feet with their powerful arms and those spears would fly and you just go right through you. So these explorers had spread the word, don't go to the island of Balana. In fact, they had spread the word about one particular warrior, the chief. They gave him a name, Thunder and Lightning. They didn't know what his real name was. His real name actually, as it turned out later, Norman Ferris found out, his real name was Taikika. But they called him Thunder and Lightning because when Thunder and Lightning would lead his warriors in an attack to charge against anybody who had landed on their beaches, the, the screaming and shouting and, and just the, the roar that he would make was so loud and scared people so bad that they said it was like having Thunder and Lightning go off all of a sudden right next to you. So Norman and Ruby had heard about the island of Balana. They had even heard from other islanders, from other islands around that island who had said, don't go there. You know, we're kind of savage. Sometimes we kill each other and sometimes we hunt people in the jungle and sometimes we worship Satan too, but we're even scared to go to the island of Balana. Does the island of Balana sound like a really fun place to go? Does it sound like an attractive place to spend your time? No, I think I could pick many other places that I would rather go to if I was a missionary than the island of Balana. But Norman and Ruby Ferris had been praying about it and they kept feeling impressed by God, you need to go to the island of Balana. They had been working on some other neighboring islands, one of the islands nearby called Rennell. That island had been pretty hostile to the, to the story of Jesus and just to, to, to having people come visit the island at first. But over the years, the people on the island of Rennell, hi, come on in. The people on the island of Rennell had started to listen and to accept missionaries and they had started to learn about Jesus and gotten very excited about it to the point that the chief of the island of Rennell, he, he sent his own son, his son's name was Moa, he said, Moa, you go to the school that Norman and Ferris has started here so you can learn about Jesus, learn about his songs. They really loved the music about Jesus. Songs like Jesus Loves Me would just get stuck in their heads. Even if they didn't know how to speak the language that they would hear the song in, even if they didn't know what the rest of the words meant, the word Jesus would get stuck from their head from that song. That's how powerful the name of Jesus is. And so they would, they would get excited about these songs. They would hear the missionaries singing. And Moa, the son of the, of the chief on the island of Rennell, had stayed with the Pharisees. He had learned things so fast. It was like God had given his mind a really good ability to learn. Ren, uh, Moa, even though he'd grown up in just a, 
a jungle village with no education, he quickly learned how to speak a couple other island languages, and he started translating the songs that he was hearing into his own language. He was starting to memorize Bible verses. His brain was amazing. Well, Norman wanted to go to the island of Balana, the island where, villager, where, 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 where jungle villagers would meet you with 15, 15 foot long spears and jumping off of high cliffs of rock to land on the sandy beaches and threaten you and chase you off of their beaches. That's where they wanted to go. And the day that they finally went, Norman said, all right, I'm going to take a group with me. Who wants to come? And you know who volunteered to go along? Moa. He raised his hand and said, I'll come along. He was only probably about 15 or 16 years old. They didn't really know because the islanders didn't keep track of exactly how old they were. They didn't have birth certificates or anything. And so Moa and a few other uh, native islanders came along. And Norman was the only white man with them. The rest of them were dark, dark, black, brown skin, Solomon Islanders. And they got on a boat. The boat was run by some European men. And when they came close enough to the shore for a canoe to go, they said, all right, you guys can get in that canoe and go. We're not getting any closer to the island of Balana. We don't want them throwing their spears out here at us in our ship. You guys go make your way and we'll be out here. If you survive, we'll pick you up and take you back. So Norman and the Islanders that had come with him got into a canoe. They came to the shore. And they landed on the shore, they couldn't see anybody anywhere. There were just tall, rocky, volcanic cliffs jutting up from behind the sand. There was jungle at the top of those cliffs. I have a picture to show you of what that looked like. So the top couple pictures here, I'll come around so everybody can see. This is what the cliffs would look like, really rocky, volcanic rock. And then down below, like maybe 30, 40 feet down, were the, uh, were the beaches where they would land. They jumped back from 30, 40 feet? Yep. And so they landed down on the beach, and they couldn't see anyone, but there was somebody watching them. In fact, there were quite a few people watching them. Watching from the jungle, including Thunder and Lightning, the chief of the warriors on the island of Balana. Norman and his men came out, and they looked around. Nobody was around. They said, well, let's pray. So they knelt down, and they prayed. And then they said, well, I guess, uh, why don't we sing? Maybe singing will bring someone out of the jungle to see us, and we can talk to them. Singing was going to bring someone out of the jungle in just a minute. So they started singing the version of Jesus Loves Me that Moa had translated into in the native language. And as they sang, they looked around, singing, 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 and all of a sudden there was thunder and lightning. Not real thunder and lightning from a storm, but the warrior thunder and lightning as he screamed out and 300 warriors with him, they all jumped off of that high rocky cliff that I showed you on the picture there, they jumped off of that high rocky cliff, jumping down to the sandy beach below, landing with their spears out and ready, and then charging barefoot up the beach towards them in just this long, wide mass of screaming, painted, spear-wielding villagers. And if I was Norman Ferris, I would already have been diving into the water and swimming back to the ship. I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, I, I, I would not have been a good person to send there. But Norman had already spent years working with some of the other Solomon Islanders. He knew some of their customs. He knew some of the ways that would help to make contact with people who might seem angry or who might seem scared. And so he did an interesting thing. He had a hat on his head and he took his hat off and he threw it on the ground in the sand between him and that onrushing, charging mass of villagers, of, of, of warriors. He threw his hat down. He took a couple steps back. And you're thinking to yourself, Oh, very nice. You don't want your hat to get a spear through it, I guess. You just want it to keep out of the way so maybe you won't get any blood on it when a spear goes through your neck. But no, Norman was smart. He actually had a plan. See, the, the villagers, the islanders, had this, had this custom that if someone either set a, a piece of clothing on the ground or if they drew a line on the ground with their finger, that that would make kind of a challenge. It would be a way of saying, hey, before you attack me, you need to recognize that I am being brave too, and then you need to formally accept my challenge. So Norman was being smart. The hat wasn't gonna keep him from necessarily killing him or attacking him or fighting him, but it would make them, it would kind of require them by their own customs to stop and look at the hat for a little bit. And that was better than not stopping and just throwing a spear into him, right? So that's what he did. Now, there was another thing Norman also did, and he did this even before he took his hat off and put it on the ground. And any guesses as to what that might have been? Prayer. Yes. 
That's what you were going to say? Prayer. Absolutely. I would hope Norman had been praying for, even before he came to the ship, and I guarantee you he was. He'd been praying for weeks and months for this, to prepare for this kind of a day. Norman stepped a couple feet back from the hat, and he just prayed, kept praying in his mind. And he didn't show any fear. He just stood there and looked as they rushed up. And that was the very first thing that thunder and lightning, the chief of the warriors, noticed. He told Norman years later when they actually became friends, so now you know, I kind of gave it away. Norman's going to survive. If any of you are hoping this was going to end with Norman limping away with two spears through his leg, I'm sorry, it doesn't go that way. Thunder and lightning, he stopped, and the first thing he noticed wasn't even the hat on the ground. He noticed that Norman wasn't afraid. He wasn't, he wasn't scared. He wasn't like getting ready to run or, or taking, grabbing one of the other people and shoving in front of him like a human shield. He was just standing there, calm, looking at him. And that really impressed Thunder and Lightning because Thunder and Lightning, he'd chased many people off this island before and never had anybody just stood there and looked at him without, without fear in their eye. Then he looked at the hat and he recognized what that meant, that this meant, okay, I challenge you. You have to decide, are you gonna, are you gonna cross that line that I just made with my clothing on the ground? And Thunder and Lightning, I'll tell you what, he wasn't gonna let any little puny, white-skinned, weird-looking guy tell him what to do. He wasn't going to show any fear of him. He was going to accept that challenge, especially because he had all of his warriors watching to see what he was going to do. He needed to show that he was braver than anybody who would come onto the island. So he reached across the line. He grabbed Norman's shirt, and he yanked so hard that he tore his shirt off. Thunder and Lightning was kind of a strong guy, you guys. I mean, you got to be strong in general to survive in the jungle. You got to climb trees and rocks and, and leap and chase animals and throw spears. But Thunder and Lightning was one of the strongest guys on the island. And he had just, just really powerful muscles and he just ripped the shirt right off of Norman. Norman kind of probably staggered a little bit, but he stayed standing and he didn't cross over the line. And so then Thunder and Lightning was so upset about this that he reached across the line again and he grabbed Norman by the arm and he squeezed. Now, if any of you have a brother, at some point in your life, I guarantee your brother has squeezed your arm. Everybody is, no, I'm not saying to actually do it right now. I'm just saying, at some point in your life, if you have a brother, your arm has been squeezed. Thunder and Lightning was squeezing the arm, and, he, and this was Thunder and Lightning, the strongest warrior on the island. This was not just your kid brother maybe kind of grabbing your arm in the back seat to, to, to get back at you for something. No, no, no. Thunder and Lightning was proving how, how powerful he was, so he clenched with all his might. He squeezed his arm as hard as he could, probably right, right below the bicep muscle right here, which hurts a lot. And Norman stood there, and somehow he didn't scream out in pain. Somehow, he didn't faint. <laughs> he just stood there. Now, it was hurting. He could feel the pain, but Norman later said it kind of felt like the pain got really bad and then it kind of quieted down, like something was kind of blocking some of the pain. And so he was just standing there looking like the bravest guy on the island right then because anybody else would have been running, screaming and terrified or crying out in pain when his arm was being squeezed by the strong hand of thunder and lightning. But Norman just stood there and thunder and lightning started realizing this isn't going the way I had planned. The guy didn't run when I jumped off that cliff screaming and yelling. He didn't run when I led my warriors chasing up to him. He didn't run when I ripped his shirt off and he's not doing anything when I'm squeezing his arm as hard as I can. My warriors are gonna start thinking I must be weak. One of the warriors in fact spoke up. He was kind of impressed with how this white guy was standing there, shirtless, hatless, with his arm getting just mangled by the powerful hand of Thunder Lightning and not reacting at all. And this warrior said, in, in the language of, uh, of Thunder Lightning, of their island, he said, let him live, let him live. He is brave. Thunder Lightning didn't like that at all because now this was going to make him look like a weak fool. It was going to make him look like he, like he couldn't defend his island, like some guy could just stand there and be stronger than Thunder Lightning. No, that was not acceptable. So Thunder Lightning said, no. He must die. He still had his arm on him, on his hand out on his arm. He must die, he said. And as he said those words, thunder and lightning felt something on his arm, and it was stronger than thunder and lightning's grasp. Thunder and lightning later told Norman it felt like the strongest hand he'd ever felt, stronger than the strongest hand he'd ever felt, grabbed him somewhere kind of by the wrist and forearm. And now I want somebody to come over here I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to take Liam. Liam, come over here. I want you to stand right here, okay? Now, I want you to grab my arm right here, okay? You get to be thunder and lightning. Not so hard. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, so you're Thunder and Lightning, you're standing there, and I'm Norman, I'm just standing here like this, and now, Corn, I want you to come here, stand on this side, and you get to be the invisible hand, okay? And what, you, what happened with the invisible hand, the invisible hand grabbed him right about here, yeah. and it kind of yanked down yeah. and over, and like in a big circle like that, and Thunder and Lightning did a cartwheel and fell on the ground on the sand. Okay, you guys can sit down. Now you gotta think about what this would've looked like to the warriors. Their chief, their strongest, bravest guy, is grabbing this man, this stranger by the arm, and the man, the white guy, doesn't move, and yet all of a sudden, their chief goes, Wah! and lands on the sand. <laughs> Does this look like your chief is strong? No. No, something's happened. Something's happened to your chief. Something, something weird, something funny, something miraculous. Thunder and lightning lay there on the ground, the, the wind was kind of knocked out of him, he's just looking up, and Norman's kind of shocked too. I mean, this is amazing. Norman knows what's happened. You know what's happened, right? An angel had intervened. As soon as Thunder and Lightning said, no, he must die, Thunder and Lightning was about to kill Norman, and God said, nope, not yet. Angel, take care of the problem. The angel took care of the problem, put Thunder and Lightning right down on the ground. And everyone just stood there, amazed. And then the warriors did probably the most natural thing to do when you see a strong guy suddenly get flipped over on his head and land on the sand. They started laughing, started giggling, <laughs> and Thunder and Lightning uh, didn't like that at all. Because uh, as you can imagine, if you're the leader of a bunch of guys, you're trying to prove you're the strongest, and then suddenly you're, on the, you're lying on the ground and they're laughing at you, that's not the way you wanted this day to go. So Thunder and Lightning got up and he said, come, and he just made the signal to follow him and he just ran off down the sandy beach. And Norman and Moa, who had been watching this, and a couple of the other islanders just dropped to their knees and they just prayed. They said, thank you to God for protecting Norman, for protecting them, and for showing the islanders the power of God. And then, they went and got in their canoe, and they went back to the boat. They weren't ready yet to try to set up base on the island. They had wanted to make contact to meet people, and while they had hoped it would have been a peaceful contact, it had gone better than it might have otherwise. So they knew now they had at least introduced themselves and the people on the island were going to talk about it. They were going to think about what, it, what they had seen happen to Thunder and Lightning and Norman hoped they would come back very soon to be able to share more about God with them, to actually talk to them and sing with them. But he wasn't able to come back for years. In fact, the next time that a missionary came to the island, it wasn't Norman at all. It was Moa. Okay, so now years later, Norman has been wanting to go back to the island, but the thing is, is that the Solomon <coughs> Islands, the government who, who was kind of ruling over those, that whole set of islands said, you can only go to those islands as a missionary if you're invited. And there was no invitation coming. And so Norman was waiting and hoping and waiting and hoping. He didn't know what was going to possibly happen, and he wouldn't get an invitation. A white missionary could only go there if he had an invitation. But then, one of Norman's islanders who had converted to Christianity, someone that we met before, decided to go to Balana. Remember the name of the kid that went with him to Balana years before? Moa. Moa. Moa decided that he was going to go to Balana. He was going to go and talk about Jesus there. He didn't need permission because he was a Solomon Islander. He could go wherever he wanted. So Moa took a group of other Islanders with him and he went back to Balana. And when they landed on the beach, this time there was no big group of warriors there to, to, to attack them and chase them and try to scare them away. So they built a little village right there on the edge of the beach, made a couple huts, and they started living there. And the people who did live on the island knew that they were there now, and they would come and they would watch them, but they weren't just coming out and attacking them. They were just observing them to see what they would do. And they would hear them singing the same songs that Moa and Norman had sang on the beach years before after Thunder and Lightning and his, and his group had run away singing Jesus Loves Me in their language. And there had been people on that island who had remembered the song all through the years because of how much impression it had made in their hearts. That name of Jesus in the song had stuck in their minds. And so now they would realize, oh, these are some of the same people who believe in that Jesus name. And they were watching to see what they would do. Well, Moa and his men, they decided they were going to go straight to being really good, strong missionaries 
And what they decided to do was instead of trying to preach to people and tell them this is why what you believe is wrong and this is why you shouldn't be worshipping Satan. And remember, they worshipped Satan quite strong on the island of Balana. Moab decided, I'm not going to spend my time preaching. I'm going to go and destroy all their idols. I mean, it was a good thing. They didn't need the idols. That, that, you know, it, they shouldn't be worshipping idols. But the thing is, Moab decided he would just go straight to destroying all the idols. So he just went around the island, him and his men. And then whatever they would find, a stone or a wooden idol, they'd destroy it. They'd break it in pieces. They'd throw it in the ocean. They'd chop it up and burn it. Um, Thunder and Lightning and his warriors were not particularly happy about this. For two reasons. One, because, well, that was their stuff. They'd spent time making these idols. That was very important to them. But also because Satan was telling them, hey, don't let them, don't let them destroy my, my idols. They would actually hear the voice of Satan sometimes talking to them. There was one particular place that they would hear the voice. There was a, a cave that was up on a cliff that overlooked the ocean. And the vo a voice would come out of that cave sometimes and talk to the islanders. If they would show up there and say, Oh, please, please, big devil God, tell us what we should do. They would actually hear a voice coming out from there. That's how strong the presence of Satan was on that island. And so you can imagine that now Satan was not eager to let these people start thinking differently. He was not eager to, to have these islanders who had served him for generations start learning about Jesus. So he started trying to turn them against these men who had showed up on the island and were destroying all the idols. Get rid of them! Do not let them do that! You have to stop them! Makes you wonder. I mean, the islanders should have thought, well, how come you don't stop them if you're so big, strong, and powerful? But Satan couldn't. They were protected. And they were serving Jesus and he couldn't touch them. So, thunder and lightning, and a bunch of the warriors started following around, waiting for the next time that they would do something. And wouldn't you know it, Moa and his men decided to go and destroy a shrine right at the foot of the cliff that looks up, and up at the top is the cave that the voice of the, of the devil would come out of, the voice of that evil angel would come out of. So as Moa and his men showed up there, and they went up to that stone-carved shrine, and they got ready to destroy it, Thunder and lightning and his men jumped out of the jungle. Stop! And they came racing up, racing up to them with their spears out, angry, surrounding them, looking at them with fierce glares, ready to just impale them on the spears like a big shish kebab. And Moa and the men stopped. And they watched to see what would happen. Thunder and lightning or some of the other warriors stepped forward. Moa was never sure who all was, was talking at that time, but they came forward and they said, Stop! We will kill you! You are not supposed to, kill, to destroy this shrine. The voice from the cave says not to. And Moa, he remembered the bravery that God had given Norman Ferris years before when Norman had stood on a beach and thunder and lightning had been right up in his face. And Moa said, I'm serving Jesus. Kill me if you want to. I'm ready to die. Everybody just stood there and watched to see what was going to happen. Was warriors just going to stab him? Moa's men all surrounded him, watching to see what would happen. And all of a sudden, a voice spoke. And I want to tell you exactly what it said. So let me find the page here. Moa spoke first. He said, I challenge the devil to get out of Balana. Kind of gutsy. Almost like throwing your hat down when there's a charging group of warriors coming at you. But maybe even scarier, because I mean, the warriors, they're just human. Now he's challenging the devil. He's challenging Satan. He says, the power of Jesus Christ is stronger than that of Satan. And immediately, all the warriors who are standing around with their spears around, getting ready to just impale Moa and his helpers, set their weapons on the ground. They just calmed down. It's like, they, it's like their anger just went away. That's pretty amazing already. But then what happened next was even more amazing. Kind of gives me the chills every time I think about it. Moa, now that nobody was holding up spears, he stepped closer to the cliff and he climbed up the incline a bit until he could get close to where the cave mouth was. And as he did, something came out of the cave. Now, I know my sons have heard the story, so you don't get to guess. But can anybody guess what came out of the cave? What did everyone there see coming out of the cave? They, what they saw didn't look like an evil spirit. It was, an, it was being controlled by an evil spirit, but it was actually something that you, would, that you could see, that you've seen before, that you could recognize. Any guesses? What was that? A bat? A bat? No. 
A man? It was not a man. Very good guess. Any other guesses? Just because I heard a story about that. Maybe pigs? Very good guess, but not pigs. <laughs> yes? Black smoke. Ooh, okay, that's a very good guess. No, what came out was an animal, and it came out walking sideways, low to the ground, going like this. Yes, it was a crab. It was a big, white crab, an albino crab. That's already pretty unusual. I mean, you know, I've never seen an albino crab. Albino animals have a hard time surviving when there's sunlight, so they usually hide deep down in caves. So this white crab came out that had obviously been living in the cave there for a long time because it had not been out in sunlight, came out, and that's already pretty amazing that this white crab comes out just as, just as Moa climbs up to the cave opening. But what happened next, I guarantee none of you have seen this ever happen. Because what Norman Ferris wrote down that happened, he said, a large white crab came to the mouth of the cave, and out of the mouth of the crab came these words. Moa, you have half the island. Give me the other half. Okay, two really amazing things there. First of all, there's a crab talking. Secondly, this crab is trying to make a deal. This crab, who's obviously being used by an evil angel, by Satan himself, is trying to make a bargain. Moa has said, in the name of Jesus, get off of this island, and the crab's coming out going, uh... How about you get half the island? All right, if, if you make somebody, if you tell somebody you have to get out of here and they say, well, how about if, how about if I only leave a little bit? You know that they're actually going to lose. They're not actually feeling strong at all. This crab was trying to make a bargain with him and the crab went, uh, uh, can I have half the island? What do you think Moa said? Yeah. Moa would not settle for that. Moa said, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom I worship and whom I serve, you get out of the island altogether. And just like the pigs that you're thinking of, Brayden, Moa says that he thought of that story of the pigs when Jesus cast out the demons from those two, from those two demoniacs and the, the, the demons went into the pigs and the pigs jumped off the cliff into the sea. The same thing happened. The crab kept on walking to the edge of the cliff and threw itself into the ocean. Nobody followed it down to see what happened to it. They didn't really have scuba tanks, but they never saw the white crab again. When that happened, though, one little detail maybe Moa had forgotten. The crab was gone. Satan had basically just said, you can have this island. However, the islanders weren't very thrilled about this. They worshipped this crab as their god. And now they got angry. What did you do? They got up with their spears. How dare you? How dare you chase our god away from our island? Moa went back down to them. And again, he said, I'm not afraid. I'm doing work for Jesus. I'm ready to die. And immediately... The warriors set their spears down and calmed down again. They sat down on the sand and they proceeded to listen while Moa told them about Jesus. He told them about God. He told them about who Satan really is. He told them, you need to make a choice. Are you going to follow Satan or not? I just chased Satan off your island, but he's not going to stay away forever if you choose to keep him here. You need to choose. Some of the islanders did choose for Jesus and those who did started witnessing the others on the island. And within a few years, when Norman finally got an invitation from Moa to come to the island, there were already eight different groups meeting, worshiping Jesus on that island. And that's the story then of how God used Norman Ferris to come to the island of Balana and introduce thunder and lightning and the people to the name of Jesus. And then years later, for Moa, who studied with Norman, who had learned about Jesus, who had translated songs and Bible verses, to come back to the island himself, and to chase the devil right out of there. That's an amazing story. I cannot wait in heaven to meet Moa. I can't wait to meet Norman. I can't wait to meet Thunder and Lightning. Do you know Thunder and Lightning got converted? He ended up also worshiping Jesus. They found out his real name was Taikika. And he ended up saying, I want to worship Jesus too. I, I don't want to be worshiping Satan and, 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 and hunting people. I want to be a follower of Jesus too. That's how much the name of Jesus can change people, guys. There is so much power in that name. It can chase Satan off an island. It can chase Satan out of your heart. So why don't we just close our eyes and pray. We're going to say thank you to God for sending us Jesus and for putting so much power in His name. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've had an opportunity during Sabbath school today to learn about the power of Jesus' name. Thank you that we've been able to think about 
the, the, the wonderful light that Jesus gives us that he can bring into any dark situation, whether it's darkness of mind in, in an island far away where people are worshiping Satan, or darkness in, in our own hearts and lives when we're feeling like we just want to choose Satan's way, we just want to listen to what Satan says. When Jesus speaks into our hearts, when he's there, his light chases all the darkness out. Help us to remember this and help us to, to carry this message to other people. To not be afraid. To think of the examples of Moa and Norman and Daniel and all the people through the ages who have stood up for you and been brave. We love you so much, God, and we are so grateful for your son, Jesus. Help us have a good rest of our Sabbath day now as we go on into church to listen and to learn, to be good examples. We love you. Amen.